Hi, welcome everybody uh, to today's seminar. So we're just going to wait a minute or two longer for everybody else to join and then we're going to get started today. So hi, so welcome to today's seminar, which is called entitled The Effects of Dog Ownership on Mental Wellbeing. And today's seminar will be delivered by Dr. Lauren Powell from the University of Pennsylvania in the US. And we're really delighted that Lauren accepted our invitation to deliver today's seminar at probably a slightly earlier time than she's used to giving talks in the US, but it fits quite well with our lunchtime seminar. So. Thanks, Lauren. Um, Lauren is a postdoctoral researcher with the Shelter Medicine Program at the University of Pennsylvania Veterinary School. And she was recently awarded a PhD from the University of Sydney for her research into the mental health effects of dog ownership and the role of oxytocin. And prior to completing her PhD, Lauren spent several years working at the RSPCA in New South Wales. So today's talk is gonna last approximately 40 minutes and then we're gonna have time at the end of the session for a question and answer session. So you can either add these to the Q&A bar throughout the session and I'll present them to Lauren at the end or you can wait till the end and ask them there. Or alternatively at the end, you can raise your hand and ask them in person. So now, uh, again, thanks to Lauren, and I'm going to pass over to Lauren for today's seminar. Thank you very much for that introduction, and thanks for inviting me to talk to you today. Uh, so most of the research that I wanted to talk to you about today does come from my PhD. Um, that was looking at dog ownership and human mental well-being. Now, I'm sure that there's undoubtedly a group of dog owners or dog lovers who are listening to this talk who absolutely think that their dog is good for their mental health. Uh, but there are also circumstances where dogs can add additional stress to our lives. And I think these three dogs here are a fairly good example of that. So we're going to start off today's talk by having a look at the pet effect, uh, what it is and how it um, views our, the current evidence in the field. We're then going to have a look at some of the challenges that we face conducting research in the field. And in the second half of the talk, uh, I want to introduce you to two of the studies that I conducted during my PhD. So the first study uh, is termed the PAUSE study. And this was an eight month long study where we looked at mental health among new dog owners. And then the second study we're gonna look at uh, focuses more specifically on oxytocin, uh, which I'm sure many of you have probably heard of before. Uh, it has gained a reputation as the love hormone. And we're gonna look at that in reference to dog walking. So to start off, what is the pet effect? Basically, it's this idea that owning a pet makes you happier and healthier. Now, there has been fairly extensive media coverage of this idea, um, and there's also been a big push from veterinary pharmaceutical companies to promote the idea that pets are good for our health. So as a result, there's a fairly widespread belief that the pet effect is true, you know, it's well tested, um, and this belief is throughout the general community and public. When we actually look at the scientific literature regarding the pet effect, uh, it's certainly not as clear cut. And this pressure from the public and media to report positive findings is actually recognized as one of the difficulties for conducting research in this field. So bearing that in mind, uh, what does the current evidence tell us? Well, I think there's undoubtedly positive effects 
for some groups of people. Now, a really good example of that, um, there's been several studies over recent years looking at veterans with PTSD and seeing how a service dog may help those veterans. And most of these studies have reported, you know, a reduction in depression, decreased loneliness and improved quality of life for those PTSD sufferers once they receive their service dog. However, the issue here is that the conditions of owning a service dog are likely to be very different to that of everyday dog ownership. So, you know, service dogs are specifically trained to support people with diagnosed illness through timely needs. Except everyday dog ownership is likely to be quite different. So when we remove all of those animal assisted interventions and service dog type studies, and we just look at everyday dog owners, we find that the evidence is actually quite mixed. So if we start off having a look at loneliness, uh, there was a recent review that was published online that identified 21 studies uh, that looked at loneliness in relation to pet ownership. Now, of those 21 studies, six found that pet owners had lower levels of loneliness. 11 of the studies, so more than half, found that there was no difference in loneliness based on pet ownership. Thankfully, only one of the studies found that pet owners were more lonely. And then three produced mixed results, meaning that loneliness may have been reduced for some pet owners, uh, but when you consider the group as a whole, uh, it certainly wasn't conclusive. When we look at studies that have investigated pet ownership and depression, we see a similar sort of story. So of 30 identified studies, 18 found that there was no difference in depression based on pet ownership. Five of the studies actually found that pet owners were more depressed than non-owners. Five found positive results in that they were less depressed. And again, two of the studies produced mixed results. So when we consider the current evidence, we can see that it's really not a clear cut answer that pets have a positive or negative effect on our mental well-being. But there are many challenges that we face in conducting research in this field. And I think some of these challenges likely contribute to some of the variability that we see in results. So the first major weakness with a lot of the studies that have been conducted so far is that they've just been looking at one point in time and basically comparing dog owners to non-owners. Now, the issue here is that there's likely to be underlying differences between dog owners and non-owners before they even look at acquiring a dog. So for example, uh, it has been suggested that perhaps dog owners feel more lonely or depressed initially, and that's actually why they want to acquire a dog. Another good example is when we look at physical activity. So it is possible that dog owners perform more physical activity prior to getting a dog, and perhaps they want to get the dog so they have someone to walk or run with. When you then look at physical activity at one point in time between owners and non-owners, we may think that it's the dog that's promoting increased walking, um, but in reality, that difference may have already existed. A second issue with a lot of the research so far is that it has been based on owners' self-reports. Now, one of the issues here is that as humans, we're not, often not very good at remembering things. Um, and this is particularly the case with physical activity. Owners will often over-report the amount of dog walking that they perform uh, compared to if we measured it objectively with a step tracker or the like. A third challenge, and this is sort of what I touched on before, uh, is that a lot of studies have been conducted in specific segments of the population and often in quite small study samples. So this was the case with our PTSD sufferers, uh, but there's also been a fair bit of research focused in children and particularly autistic children um, or also older adults. And this just makes it difficult for us to extrapolate those findings to you know, everyday dog owners living in the community. A fourth issue in the field is the possibility of bias. Now, most researchers, and this is myself included, 
who are conducting human to dog research are there because they love dogs. And so it's possible that even subconsciously we want to produce positive results. Uh, but it's also possible that this may affect the likelihood of negative results being published. And then the fifth challenge uh, arises from the fact that every human to dog relationship is so different. So just to expand on that point, um, in this figure here, I've presented some of the possible variables that can affect the human to dog relationship. So things like the amount of dog walking that an owner performs, that has a fairly obvious link with health in that it's likely to increase their physical activity. But there's other things such as the level of attachment. So it has been predicted that maybe owners that are more attached to their dogs actually gain greater health benefits from interacting with their dogs and owning the dog. There's also dog characteristics that come into this. So the dog's breed or age and their behaviour are all likely to affect the human to dog relationship. So for example, if an owner has a very fearful or perhaps aggressive dog, you know, that in itself can serve as a source of stress for the owner. But it's also possible that the owner may not be comfortable walking their dog as much because of the behavioural problems. Um, and this then may reduce their physical activity. So all of these different elements are very likely to affect both the human to dog relationship and health outcomes, um, but they're often not incorporated in research. Now, despite the fact that the evidence so far is fairly mixed and there's all these challenges that we face, there are certainly hypothetical pathways through which owning a dog may be beneficial for our mental wellbeing. So here I've just shown three of those possible pathways. The first of which is through increased physical activity through dog walking. The second possible pathway is through the social support and companionship that dogs can provide us. And then the third pathway is through hormone release. Now, as this diagram shows, uh, each of the pathways are likely to overlap and sort of work in unison to produce the possible positive effect of dog ownership. So if we start off by having a look at physical activity. Now there's quite strong links between physical activity and mental well-being in itself. Uh, you know, physical activity has been shown to help reduce symptoms of depression and anxiety. But the thing that makes dog walking quite unique is it adds a purpose to that activity. And as a result of this purpose, it's more likely for owners to engage with the dog walking over a long period of time. Whereas, you know, owners might be really motivated for a month or so, uh, sorry, non-owners might be motivated for a month or so, but that motivation may dwindle off. The other thing that's quite unique about dog walking is that dogs themselves can motivate the owners to walk. So I'm sure any dog owner knows what it's like when you get home from a long day and the last thing you feel like doing is taking the dog out. Um, but if they're jumping around at your feet and possibly even coming up with their lead in their mouth, um, then that can certainly serve as a source of motivation to get out and get walking. Now, there has been a fair bit of research in this field um, and a recent study that pulled together all of the available data found that dog owners walk on average 52 minutes more per week than non-owners. So this is quite a big difference and likely to have an effect on health outcomes. Now, the other thing that's quite unique about dog walking is that many owners say that they gain feelings of happiness and that it helps them reduce stress. So there have been studies that have found owners are more happy when walking their dog compared to when walking, uh, when walking by themselves. Now, I pulled this quote here from a participant um, that was in a UK study of dog walkers, and I think they've summed it up really nicely. And this participant said, it just feels special when they're there with you. It makes a good walk an excellent walk. And I think that shows how there is a clear possibility that dog walking may be good for our mental well-being. 
Now, the second possible pathway that I mentioned uh, was through the social and emotional support and companionship that dogs can provide. So again, this can work in multiple different ways. It is possible that dog companionship can help to reduce our feelings of loneliness directly. But it's also possible that owning a dog can increase our human social interactions. So time and time again, research has shown that people are more likely to approach a stranger if they're accompanied by a dog. And this has been shown across different uh, segments of the population, you know, people with disabilities and severe mental illness have also reported that people are more likely to approach them if they have a dog with them. The other way that this can increase human social interactions uh, is for new dog owners in their neighbourhood. So many dog owners report meeting others as a result of owning their dog. And I think that this photo here is a perfect example of that. Now, there's a bunch of people out walking their dogs who may not have known each other if it wasn't for their shared interest in dog ownership. Now, the third way that dogs' emotional support may help us is by buffering our stress when we're exposed to stressful events. Now, this idea has been tested out in a number of studies. Uh, some were conducted among university students, but also studies conducted uh, among general pet owners. And so there's one particular study where the pet owners had to undergo a maths test. And they either had the company of their pet, of their spouse, a friend or by themselves. And what this study found was the pet reduced the human stress, um, stress response to the maths test much, much more than when they underwent the test with a spouse, a friend or by themselves. Now it's possible that this is due to the fact that dogs love is generally unconditional, they're non-judgmental and you know they're not evaluating your answers to the maths test in the same way that a spouse or a friend may. However, most of these studies have looked at short-term stressful events um, and so the long-term effects of you know longer stressful exposure and dog ownership are not clear at this stage. Now, the third pathway that I mentioned uh, is through hormone release. So there are two main hormones that have been associated with human to dog interactions. The first of these hormones is oxytocin, the love hormone, um, and this can have positive effects in reducing stress and for cardiovascular health as well. And then the second hormone is cortisol. So it has been suggested that interacting with a dog can reduce our stress hormone levels. And both of these things could obviously affect mental well-being. Now, I think all of this is particularly important with the current climate and COVID-19. And there have been several studies focusing on the role of pet ownership during this time. And what these studies have found was that owning a pet was protective against some of the mental health effects of COVID-19. So generally pet owners had lower spikes in loneliness compared to non-owners and the same for stress. Now these owners reported um, that their pet helped them in a variety of different ways during this period. So many owners reported that their pet helped them to maintain a routine. You know, they had to get up in the morning and let the dog out to go to the bathroom or feed the dog. It also helped them to maintain their physical activity levels. They said that the dog provided a source of emotional support and companionship, and that it helped people stay connected with others within their neighbourhood. But there's also unique challenges that come with owning a dog at this time. You know, many owners have faced difficulties in accessing vet care. There's also been many owners who have reported new problem behaviours with their dogs. So, you know, many dogs are getting used to the fact that the owner is home all the time. And then when they're left, they don't handle it so well and perhaps become destructive. There's also the issue of zoonotic disease. Um, and I want to stress that there's no evidence at this point that dogs can give us COVID-19, but there has been evidence that dogs have caught it from their owners. 
and that may present a source of stress for some owners. And then obviously many people are facing economic difficulties during this time and dog ownership can be quite costly. So with all of that in mind, that brings me to the first study I wanted to talk to you about, which is called the PAUSE study or the Physical and Effective Wellbeing of Dog Owners study. Now in this study, we tried to overcome some of the weaknesses in the field. And we did that by looking at the influence of dog acquisition on human health. So we looked at people before they brought the dog home and then compared their health measures over an eight month period. Now in this study, we collected a range of different measures. We looked at mental well-being, um, the owner's social interactions. We also took measures of their sleep and physical activity. We collected blood pressure, um, BMI and cardiorespiratory fitness. And then we also took some measures of dog behavior and physical activity. But in today's talk, I'm just gonna focus on these two here. So the mental well-being and social interaction side of things. So there was four different elements of mental well-being that we considered. Uh, the first was loneliness. We then looked at positive and negative mood and psychological distress, which included symptoms of depression and anxiety. And then, as I mentioned, we looked at owners' social interactions. Now, I know this diagram here is a little bit overwhelming, but I just quickly wanted to show you how the study design worked so that we can make a bit more sense of the results. So basically, at the start of the study, all of our participants were petless. They didn't have a dog or a cat or any other type of furry pet. They could then choose to go into one of three groups. So in the green group, we have our dog acquisition group. And these guys agreed to adopt a dog within one month of completing their baseline measurements. We then had in the yellow, our lagged control group. Uh, so this was people who said that they were interested in owning a dog but they agreed not to get one for the study period. And then in the orange, we have our community control group. And this was basically people who had no interest in owning a dog in the future and had not owned one in the recent past. Now, the reason that we included both the yellow and the orange, the two control groups, was so that we could tease out any possible differences that were just underlying differences between people who are interested in pet ownership and those who are not. So I wanted to give you a quick idea of what the participants looked like. Uh, we had 17 people who ended up adopting a dog, 29 people who were in the lagged control who wanted to get a dog in the future but didn't get one during the study, and then 25 people who had no interest in dog ownership whatsoever. And so the first thing you'll notice is that our community control group was significantly older than our other two groups who are interested in owning a dog. They also had really high levels of education. So 88% of our community control group had a bachelor's degree or higher. Now this is probably due to the way that we recruited this group of people. Um, a lot of them heard about the study through university emails or newsletters and those sorts of things. Um, but this difference in age and education will become important. Okay, so these are the four different questionnaires uh, that we used for mental wellbeing. And you can see we have the results for loneliness, positive and negative mood and psychological distress. We're gonna start off by having a look at loneliness. So you can see we have our loneliness score, um, a higher score meaning that they were more lonely. Um, and then along the bottom, we have the three measurements that we completed at baseline, middle of the study and end of the study. And you can see that our dog adoption group, the green group actually had the highest levels of loneliness at the start, but this decreased significantly by the middle of the study and then maintained at that lower level until the end of the study. So this was obviously a really positive finding. It seems that dogs are good for people's loneliness. Um, and we saw a reduction just after they brought that dog home. However, when we controlled for that difference in education and age that I just mentioned, 
uh, this result was no longer statistically significant. So therefore, it's, it's just another one of those mixed results um, that I was talking about at the start. When we look at positive effect, uh, we can see a similar type pattern, obviously in the opposite direction, in that dog owners had an increase in positive mood between the start of the study and the middle of the study. Um, and obviously they'd acquired a dog during that period. And that high level of positive mood was then maintained till the end of the study. Uh, but this result was not statistically significant, um, which is possibly due to you know, the variation in what's going on with the lagged control and community control groups as well. If we look at negative mood, this sort of mirrors our loneliness results in that dog owners had the highest level of negative mood at the start, and this then steadily decreased by the middle of the study and maintained at that lower level until the end of the study. Again, this was not statistically significant. And then finally, if we consider psychological distress, a similar type pattern. We see a reduction in the symptoms of depression and anxiety at that middle of the study point. Uh, but here there was a little bit of a rebound to eight months. Again, this difference was not statistically significant. So it's quite interesting if we look at these four measures together on one slide, they all seem to tell the same story. It seems that dog ownership did have a positive effect on mental well-being. Um, but as I mentioned, most of these results were not statistically significant. Um, and this could be due to the fact that we did only end up with 17 dog adopters. Uh, we found that it was quite difficult to get in touch with these people. Um, generally, people would contact us once they'd already brought the dog home. And the difficulty then is that we couldn't complete the baseline measurements. So I think to really tease out these differences, we need a larger study with more dog adopters. Um, but there's certainly some promising trends there. Now that brings me to the second study I wanted to talk to you about today, uh, which was looking at oxytocin, uh, specifically in relation to dog walking. So oxytocin has gained a reputation as the love hormone. Um, the reason being that it's quite important in human bonding. Um, that includes romantic relationships, friendships, and maternal bonding with mother and child. And as I mentioned, the release of oxytocin also has some positive effects for our body. So it has been shown to reduce stress um, and it has some positive cardiovascular effects as well. Now there has been some previous work that has found that oxytocin seems to be involved in human to dog bonding. Now here I've presented probably one of the most well-known studies in the field. Um, and this study was conducted by a Japanese group of researchers and it was published in 2015. And what these researchers did was they recruited a sample of dogs and their owners, and then a group of hand reared wolves and their owners as well. So each of the humans and dogs or humans and wolves had to provide a urinary sample at the start of the study they then underwent a 30 minute interaction when they could, you know, pat with their dog or wolf or gaze at them and those sorts of things. And then they provided another urine sample at the end of the study. And so what the researchers found was that for dogs and their owners who spent a significant portion of the interaction gazing towards each other, they saw a spike in oxytocin. So on the top graph there in maroon, we have the owner's oxytocin level, and you can see there was quite an increase from pre-interaction to post-interaction levels. Down the bottom, we have those dogs, um, and you can see a similar type increase. I know it does look a bit smaller, but the scale of the figure down the bottom is quite a bit larger. So it is still a marked increase in oxytocin. Now, when the researchers looked at wolves and their owners, they actually found that the wolf's oxytocin concentration decreased following the interaction. And for the owners, it was basically a flat line from pre to post interaction. So from this, uh, the researchers thought or concluded that 
oxytocin seems to be important in human to dog bonding and that it is specifically related to this gazing behavior that dogs and owners sometimes share. Now we wanted to build on this evidence. Um, you know, the Japanese group had looked at a very specific form of interaction being gazing. Um, and we wanted to expand this and see how dog walking affected human and dog oxytocin levels. Now we thought that dog walking would probably have a bigger effect on oxytocin uh, because exercise itself can boost oxytocin. And we thought that the exercise combined with the human to dog interactions may result in that bigger spike. The other part of this study uh, was to look at the strength of human to dog attachment and see how that affected human or dog oxytocin levels. So here we hypothesized that maybe owners that were more attached to their dogs would have a greater increase in oxytocin after they interacted with the dog. So to test out these hypotheses, uh, we recruited a sample of 30 dog owners and their male dogs. Each owner then had to perform these four different activities in a random order. So in activity one, they took their dog for a walk on leash. Uh, in activity two, they walked without their dog, but along the same route. In activity three, uh, they could interact with their dog in any affiliative manner. So basically they could pat them, cuddle them, talk to them, um, as long as it wasn't an active form of interaction. So, you know, they weren't playing fetch or that sort of thing. And finally, in activity four, the owner basically just had to sit quietly. Uh, they couldn't interact with other people or animals during this time. So to measure oxytocin, uh, we collected saliva samples from all of the humans before and after each activity. And we then collected urine samples uh, before and after activity one and three for our dogs. Now to measure attachment, we asked our owners to fill out a questionnaire. Um, it had a range of questions about things like how often they take their dog to visit other people, other friends or family members, or how often the dog goes in the car. Uh, we also asked the owners about their emotional closeness with the dog and any perceived costs of ownership. Um, so that could be financial or time, those sorts of things. Okay, so if we start off by having a look at the human oxytocin response, um, you can see we have our four different activities down the bottom. And then on the graph, we have the change in oxytocin from before each activity to afterwards. Now we can see that for dog walking and walking without the dog, there was virtually no change in oxytocin um, following the activity. For human to dog interactions, we saw a slight decrease, although that was not statistically significant. And then the same sort of thing for the control condition. There was a slight increase, but again, it was not statistically significant. Now, if we then have a look at our dog's oxytocin response, um, again, we have the two activities that they were involved in, dog walking and human to dog interactions. And following both activities, we saw a non-significant difference in the dog's urinary oxytocin concentration. So both the human and dog oxytocin responses were obviously not as we had expected. Um, we thought we would see a boost in the oxytocin concentration, but that was not the case. Now the next step was to look at how attachment influenced the human oxytocin response to each of these activities. So the way we tested this, uh, we divided our dog owners into two groups, uh, one that reported below median levels of attachment to their dogs, and then the other group that reported higher levels of attachment to their dogs. And what we have here are some pairwise comparisons. So basically we're looking at the change in oxytocin following dog walking compared to walking and then following the affiliative interaction compared to the control. And so what we see is for our low attachment owners, they had a significant increase in oxytocin following dog walking compared to walking without the dog. And then again, a significant increase in oxytocin following the 
affiliative interaction where they cuddled um, compared to the control condition. Now for our high attachment owners, there was basically no difference in the oxytocin change between dog walking and walking without the dog. Um, and for the affiliative compared to the control condition, there was a slight decrease, but again, this was not statistically significant. So overall, we did not find a consistent pattern when we looked at the whole sample for humans or dogs in terms of a positive response to uh, interaction. And then we found this interesting role of attachment that was in the opposite direction to what we had originally hypothesized. So this led us to think that perhaps low attachment owners actually get more benefit from interacting with their dog. Now there has been some previous research that supports this idea. Um, so in this previous study, uh, there was a bunch of children who each underwent a stress test with the company of a dog. Some of those children had a secure style of attachment and other children had what's termed an insecure attachment style. And for those children with insecure attachment styles, they actually gained more benefit from that dog being there with them. So they had a lower stress response with the dog compared to the children in the secure attachment style group. So I think that this just sort of highlights the importance of considering attachment when we look at the human to dog relationship and mental health. There were very various other challenges that we faced in this study. Uh, one of the main ones being the measurement of oxytocin. So there's currently a lot of debate between researchers about what the best way to measure oxytocin is. Um, we find that there is often poor correlation between different samples. Um, so for instance, blood oxytocin may not mirror the concentration of oxytocin in our urine or saliva. And we also have quite a poor understanding of the relationship between central oxytocin within our brain and then oxytocin in our other bodily fluids such as blood or urine or saliva. And so there was a review published just last year and it was talking about these exact challenges. And in this review, they likened the measurement of oxytocin to this idea of blind men describing an elephant. So if we you know, blindfolded a bunch of different people and asked them to describe an elephant, they would all give us very different results based on where they were touching that animal. And I think that perhaps the measurement of oxytocin is the same. Perhaps we're actually looking at different things when we consider salivary oxytocin compared to urine, compared to blood. So I think that these differences explain some of the variability in our results um, and hopefully as measurement techniques improve we'll get a little bit more of a clear picture about the role of oxytocin. There are other possible explanations for our findings differing from that of previous research. Um, the first was the fact that I was there. So for each of these activities, I would turn up to the participants' home, we would have a brief discussion about what we were going to do for that day, um, and then we would collect the salivary sample. And it is possible that during that brief interaction, uh, the owners had a boost in their oxytocin concentration, which would have meant that the baseline level was higher than would normally be expected. And perhaps that's why we didn't see a further increase following the human to dog interaction. It's also possible that the sex of the dogs influence the way they interact with their owners and possible oxytocin. Uh, so you'll remember that I said all of the dogs in our sample were male. This was basically because it's much easier to collect a urine sample from a male dog than it is a female dog. But this figure that I've got on the slide here is from that same paper from the Japanese group of researchers. And I wanted to show you this difference that they saw among the owner of male dogs compared with the owners of female dogs. You'll see that the owners of male dogs had a much, much smaller increase in oxytocin after interacting with their dog compared to the owners of female dogs. So it is possible that the dog's sex influences how they choose to interact with us, which may then influence our oxytocin. 
The other thing to consider here is the issue of publication bias. Um, I mentioned at the start that it is possible that in human to dog research, negative results are less likely to be published. Um, and this has also been identified in oxytocin research in that results that found no effect are less likely to be published. So it's possible that the current literature gives us a bit of a warped view of the true effect of human to dog interactions on oxytocin. Okay, so if we pull all of that together, what do we find? Basically, there was a possible decrease in loneliness. Um, it was statistically significant, but then when we accounted for these differences in education and age, that result was no longer statistically significant. Although on a figure, there seemed to be a clear trend for mood and psychological distress. These results were also not statistically significant. And then we found that human to dog interactions don't influence oxytocin in the way that we expected. So all in all, I think all of the research that I conducted just adds to the mixed evidence. But I also think it's very important to remember that absence of evidence is not necessarily evidence of absence. So it's very possible that the tools that we're using to capture loneliness or positive and negative mood, perhaps they don't accurately measure the elements of mental well-being that dog ownership really affects. It's also possible that dog ownership is only a positive experience for some owners. And perhaps when we look at the whole group as a whole, we're not going to find the effect, but that it could exist for certain people within the population. So I just quickly like to thank all of my supervisors, uh, Manos Stamatakis, Paul McGreevy, Kate Edwards, and Adrian Bauman um, for their support throughout my PhD, um, as well as Ms. Lynn Cattell who funded the research scheme and then all of our different animal rescue partners and Animal Medicines Australia. And that should hopefully leave us with plenty of time for questions. Hi Lauren, that's me back. Uh, thank you for a fantastic talk. I thought it was really interesting and insightful, especially around what you talked about. Some of the evidence um, potentially is, so we've got small sample sizes, potentially biased groups and that impacting the evidence. I really liked your elephant analogy as well. I think this could be really useful in a lot of our research to think about the different areas we're looking at and making our assumptions. Um, so we can now open to some questions. So if people would like to ask Lauren a question, you could either do that using the chat function um, or within the Q&A bar, or you could raise your hand um, and I can unmute you um, and then you can ask the question yourself. While we're waiting for questions coming through, Lauren. I had a question, I was thinking about your results around mental health um, and it showed that bounce back at the second follow, follow up. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts about why that happened? It's really difficult to say. So the result that you're talking about was specifically for psychological distress. So symptoms of depression or anxiety, I'm just trying to find it. This one here, I think that uh, symptoms of depression and anxiety are probably going to be quite different to other, you know, more widespread emotions like positive mood or negative mood. Um, it's perhaps a smaller proportion of the population that experience those sorts of symptoms of psychological distress. Um, so it's difficult to say why that one in particular showed a bit of a bounce back compared to the others. Um, it's also very possible that you know, the effects of dog ownership on mental well-being may be relatively short-lived. So for instance, people might get the dog, be really enthusiastic with walking for the first three months and then sort of lose motivation for it um, or lose motivation for interacting with the dog every day. You know, those sorts of differences in dog ownership over time um, are very poorly understood at, at this current moment. That's interesting. I, I also thought, um, in terms of the hormone research, and you showed that people with high and low attachment and those differences there. So is there the potential that dog ownership could have 
greater health benefits for those who don't really have a prior dog love or attachment? Yeah, so when we were considering attachment in that study, it was specifically based on the owner's attachment to their current pet. Um, it is, it's, yeah, attachment's a funny thing. So in a lot of the human to dog research, we've often considered the strength of attachment. Um, although a lot of human only research considers attachment based on style. So I think that that's certainly something to look for board when we're in the human to animal research to potentially incorporate these different elements of attachment style um, and then we may be able to gain a bit more understanding of the difference between high and low attachment owners um, but in a very brief nutshell you know insecure attachment often stems from when people um, they don't necessarily have a consistent attachment figure growing up so they don't have someone that they can necessarily rely on um, and so it's possible that these sorts of people that have insecure attachment styles throughout their life they may also report low attachment to the owner but gain great benefit from being with that dog um, because it is still a source of you know companionship and reliability so the health benefits are quite great yeah. here. <laughs> Um, if anyone else would like to ask a question, I've just had a question um, come through from Mary Kate, who's a researcher in the unit. So she asked, if you redid your PhD study, uh, what would you do differently? Oh, a lot of things. <laughs> um, so if we're talking about this one um, that I'm mentioning at the moment, the pause study, one of the biggest challenges that we faced was that we incorporated all these measurements of um, physical activity and other measurements of health. Uh, but basically, we had to take all of these measures prior to the individuals bringing the new dog home. And so for physical activity, we were measuring it with an accelerometer for a one week period. Um, we also had to meet with the participant and they had to complete a step test. Um, anyway, there was a big range of measures. And because of this, it was really quite difficult to schedule the baseline appointment before people brought their dog home. So perhaps they'd contact us on a Wednesday and say, I'm picking up the dog on a Saturday, um, but we obviously couldn't collect one week's worth of physical activity data within that period. Um, and so I think there was a lot of people that were discounted for that reason. Um, and it made recruitment quite difficult. And that is why we ended up with only 17 dog owners. So what I would probably change looking forward um, would be reducing the amount of measures that we took um, and perhaps reducing the length of physical activity measurement prior to getting the dog because that was a big barrier for us. Yeah, that does sound like a big barrier. What, um, could you tell us a bit more about the research you're now conducting at Pennsylvania? Yeah, sure. Um, so my research now is with the shelter medicine program within um, the veterinary faculty. So it's a little bit more based on the dog side of things, but certainly still incorporating that human element. Um, so for example, one of the studies that I'm doing at the moment is looking at when adoptions from animal shelters are unsuccessful. Um, so when owners adopt an animal, but then they return the animal to the shelter um, within several months for whatever reason. And basically we're trying to understand what promotes people to have to return the animal, you know, is it because they had unrealistic expectations prior to bringing the pet home? Um, is it because the animal has behavioral problems that they're struggling to deal with? So we're trying to identify what drives those unsuccessful adoptions um, with the long-term view of hopefully being able to provide some support services. So if people are struggling with their pet during those first few months, we can hopefully help them to keep the animal in the home. Um, so that's one of the major studies that I'm conducting at the moment. Um, and then a second one is looking at the quality of life of animals in animal shelters. Uh, so it's probably not surprising that when dogs and cats spend a significant portion of their day within a quite a small cage that can be quite stressful for them 
Um, they also have a lack of routine. You know, it's different people coming in to care for them every day. Um, and animal shelters are often quite noisy environments too. So there's lots of different elements of that environment that can be stressful for animals. Um, and we're trying to develop an app that will allow people who work in animal shelters to assess how that animal is truly doing, how stressed they are, um, whether we need to look at alternatives for the animal, you know, should we be trying to get them out to a foster care home or those sorts of things. So that's two examples of the sort of research that I'm doing at the moment. Yeah, really interesting and important work. Um, uh, thanks for telling us about that. Another question just come through, um, which Somebody asked, they're interested in whether stronger attachments and bonding with a new puppy uh, opposed to an older rescue dog. Are there differences, have you found differences between those? Yeah, this is a really great question. Um, so it's not something that I had enough data to look at during my PhD study. Uh, we did only have 17 adopters. Um, and so it wasn't enough to sort of tease out those differences. And as far as I'm aware, there's not literature that has looked at specifically this question, but I think it very much depends on the individual. You know, when we're specifically talking about returns to animal shelters, a lot of people report that they adopted an adult dog and perhaps it had behavioral problems or they were struggling to integrate it to the home environment and they said in the future that they would get a puppy. But then on the flip side of that, there's lots of situations where people adopt a puppy and they say it's way too much work, you know, the training is a nightmare. And they say in the future that they would look at adopting an older or a rescue dog. So I think it really depends on the individual, um, what they expect from pet ownership um, and their lifestyle circumstances and how much they're willing to put in to training a new puppy. It's quite, it sounds quite a complicated picture. Yeah, pet ownership, it's, yeah, it's very different for every individual, which makes it something hard to research. Yeah, and it seems quite hard to measure and hard to recruit as well, which um, yeah. seems to influence a lot of the findings. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's, we're coming to the end of the time now. So I'd just really like to thank you, Lauren, for giving today's talk. Um, I found it really interesting. Um, I know, I know you probably haven't had the reception because it's virtual, but fantastic. And thank you. We really appreciate you giving your time and a successful start of the day for you. For you yeah. I am. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much for having me. Um, I hope you all enjoyed the talk. It was great to be able to talk to you. Thank you. And good luck with the next stages of the work. And thanks again, Lauren. Thank you very much. Thank you.